thanks everybody for coming. So uh, yeah, Vivian told me to be as advanced as possible. So uh, the slides are more like all the very complicated things you can do with scikit-learn, but I also want to go through all the introductory stuff, maybe a bit more as there are a couple of people who don't have that much uh, background using scikit-learn at all. So yeah, I'm Andreas Muller. I'm at the NYU Center for Data Science. I'm one of the core developers of scikit-learn. Um, just a little bit about myself. I did my PhD in the University of Bonn using structured prediction for image segmentation. I went to Amazon Machine Learning in Berlin, working on computer vision applications and time series forecasting. And I've got to go closer to the mic. All right. Um, and now since the end of last year, I'm at the NYU Center for Data Science, where I work, work on open source for data science. In particular, I basically now do uh, scikit-learn full time there, which is cool. So as you probably know, scikit-learn is a Python library for doing machine learning. It includes a lot of algorithms for doing standard machine learning tasks like classification, regression, clustering, dimensionality reduction, manifold learning, together with a lot of tools to uh, do parameter estimation, model selection, pre-processing, and so on. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how to do all this. Well, um, scikit-learn is a huge community effort. So this is the list of the, I think, like 36 people that are part of the GitHub organization. So that's the people that can merge your pull requests. Um, there's at any time, there's 10 to 20 people really active uh, of the core developers, but each release has about 100 to 200 people that contribute to the release. So we just released a 0 0.16 last Friday, and I think there were 163 uh, people contributed to the release. So yeah, brief overview of my talk here. I want to start uh, quickly with some basic concepts in scikit-learn. And then I want to mostly focus on uh, model building and evaluation and um, how you can set hyperparameters. Then I want to talk a little bit about out of core learning, how to learn when your data doesn't fit into your memory. And then I want to talk very briefly at the end about um, stuff that is new and uh, the release from last Friday. So most of machine learning that people do is supervised learning, I'd say. And uh, um, to do a supervised machine learning task in scikit-learn, you start uh, picking your model. Let's say you want to do a classification task, and you uh, pick a random forest classifier. And um, the algorithm will be encapsulated in a class, and so instantiate your class. And you uh, give it your training data, x train, and your training labels y train. In scikit-learn, we always call the data x and the labels y. And you call the fit function to uh, create a model. And so the CLF object will now contain um, everything that's estimated from the data, so all the um, decision trees that were trained. Uh, X is always in scikit-learn um, numpy array, that is number of samples times number of features. Y train in this case would just be um, an array of labels for classification. Okay, so this fit. Uh, stores your model in a uh, CLF object. And if you get some new test data, you can call the predict function on some uh, array x test and will give you a prediction. You can also use the score function on this classifier object. Uh, this will give you the accuracy uh, of applying the model on x test and compare it to um, y test. The other class of models that um, it's most frequently used, I think, is what I want to call unsupervised transformations, like principal component analysis, PCA. So here you have some training data, and you estimate a model from your training data. You again just call fit, this time without any labels, because it's an unsupervised algorithm. And uh, this gives you a model of the principal components, so it um, stores what are the directions in the data that span the most variance. And then you can use this on some new data, um, yeah, I reduced my data to three components, and I can call transform on a new um, array uh, x test, and it will transform the data to the pre three, principal component, three principal components of my training data set. And so the basic API is really um, for everything. There's estimated at fit to fit the model, uh, always with x, but sometimes also with some supervised information uh, y. And then there's predict, if you want to predict a new labeling, as in classification or in regression, or where you predict a target, or in clustering, where you want to predict for some algorithms um, what is the cluster membership of some new data. And there's, uh, some algorithms have a transform, which is when you want to transform a new, want to get a new view of your data, a new X, basically. Such as in pre processing, if you want to scale your data, or if you want to do dimensionality reduction, as in PCA, or if you want to do feature selection or feature extraction. 
then uh, your model will have a transform method. And so these are only this, basically the only three methods you really need to remember to use scikit-learn. It's uh, fit, predict, and transform. And that's sort of the core API. And all of these basically always operate on um, NumPy arrays, except for some feature extraction. And things that you might want to do with your model is, for example, evaluate it using cross-validation, which is quite simple, using um, the cross-validation module, which in particular contains the cross vault score function. So the cross vault score function takes uh, any model that you like. For example, here, SVC st is, stands for support vector classifier. It's just a kernelized support vector machine, uh, libSVM. So it takes this model together with some data, x, the true uh, labels y, and then some way to do cross-validation. Here it says cv equal to five, which means uh, five-fold cross-validation. For classification, it actually does stratified cross-validation. And then um, this cross fault score runs the cross validation for you, and print scores will um, just give you the cross validation scores for the five splits. And as you can see, it does basically perfectly because I used iris. So um, there's other ways to do cross validation. Um, there's a lot of classes in this cross validation module that give you different kinds, to, uh, different ways to split the data. For example, one is shuffle split, um, where you give the number of samples in your data set and um, then the test set size that you want and the number of iterations. So what this does is it just randomly splits your data. Like in this example, split off 30% for, for a test set and it does this randomly 10 times. And um, so this will give you 10 numbers. Sometimes this is, uh, or sometimes people prefer this over uh, cross validate, like k-fold cross validation because you can independently tune how big your test set is from the number of iterations you do. And you might get a more robust estimate. Um, another, so here basically I, I just, sorry, I just created this class, shuffle split, and instead of CV equal to a number, uh, I give CV equal to this object that I created. Another one that's um, fairly popular is leave one label out. Here label doesn't refer to uh, a class label as in classification, it's some external information. Let's say you're in a medical context where you have um, multiple patients and you have multiple data points per patient. And you want to know, can I generalize from one patient to another patient? So you don't want one patient to be both in a test and a training set. Leave, so here the labels would be, which patient does this da uh, data point belong to? And leave one label out, but put one whole patient in a test set. That doesn't happen only in a medical context. Um, for example, if you do work with websites and you have data from different websites, you might want to um, generalize across websites or across customers, or if there's any uh, kind of grouping that you want to be robust to, you can use this um, to do cross-validation respecting you, uh, these labels. So most algorithms in scikit-learn, as always in machine learning, have a lot of hyperparameters that you want to tune. So um, in scikit-learn, there's cross-validated grid search, which helps you tuning parameters. Particularly important if you want to use RBF kernel SVMs. So the grid search is implemented in the class that's called grid search CV in the grid search module. Before you do grid search, I would always advise to split up some test set to do final evaluation. So here I also get this train test split um, function and spl split my data. I think it is 25% in a test set and the rest for training. And I'll do training on the, uh, sorry, I do grid search on the training part and then I'll keep the test part for the end. To do grid search with scikit-learn, you uh, need to define what are the parameters you want to search over. Here I have a radial basis function uh, support vector machine, and I want to adjust the parameters C and gamma. So I, and for, for that, I need to create a dictionary where the keys are the parameters, in this case, C and gamma. And uh, the values are the parameters, so the parameter values I want to search over. So I put in here this is an exponential grid, going from 0 0.001 to 100, uh, both for C and gamma. Then I can instantiate this grid search CV class with my classifier, the support vector machine, and this dictionary, this param grid. This um, grid search CV acts as um, what we like to call a um, um, meta estimator. So this grid search CV now looks ex exactly like the support vector machine, it has fit, predict, and score. But what it does behind the scenes is a, bit, is a bit more complicated. So if you call fit on the training set, what it will do is it will um, try each possible combination of the C and gamma, do cross-validation um, for each combination, then pick the best value of the parameters. Then it'll use this uh, value and train again, this time on the whole training set. 
then it will store this model, train it with the best parameter setting on the whole training set, and this is what it will be used for predict and score. So um, th this is what's going on here behind the scenes, but you can just sort of call fit and predict. Uh, so this was the setting uh, up to now was basically if you're training data and you have a training labels and you create a model and you want to adjust some parameters for your model. But usually it doesn't look like this. Usually there's the data that you get is quite different from the data that you want to feed your model and there's steps in there like feature extraction, scaling, feature selection and so on. And the mistake people often make is that they do cross-validation or parameter estimation just around the model and they don't uh, include the feature selection and scaling. The problem here is that um, if you do cross-validation here, the, uh, the, test, the test part of your cross-validation was already used in the feature extraction and the scaling, so you're cheating and um, your estimate of your generalization error will be very optimistic. So what you should actually be doing is do cross-validation over your whole feature extraction and everything pipeline. The way to do this in scikit-learn is with pipelines. And uh, in the pipeline module, there's a function called make pipeline which you can give um, basically a list of estimators where the first ones are all ones that have a transform and the last one can be anything. In this very simple example here, I do a, use a standard scalar which just uh, mean removal and scaling to variance one and then it's for a vector machine. And so what this uh, pipeline does is it will fit the first step, then call it transform on the first step. The transformed data will be the one with mean removed and variance scaled to one and we'll pass this transformed version to the second step. This could again be a transformer, uh, which, will, which would be fit on the data, then it, the data would be transformed again, and, and, so, and so on, until it's passed to the last step where it just calls fit. Sorry, here, so he, here there's no cross-validation yet. Hmm? Sorry? It's hard to, okay, I can use this. So here there is no cross-validation yet, but I'll, I'll come to this point in a second. So here, um, if I call fit here on the training data set, it'll, it'll fit the first one on the training part, um, transform the uh, training part, fit the second one on the transformed version. If I call predict, it will call uh, transform on the standard scalar uh, and then call um, predict on the second part. So the thing why I want to do this like this and not just write it by hand basically is now I can fit, feed this into my grid search. So if I feed this into my grid search, um, the grid search does a splitting of the data in the cross-validation. And so um, both steps of the pipeline will see during fit only the training part of the split. So is that clear? So Okay, so um, because this, this pipeline acts as a single estimator now and will see only the training part for training it and only the uh, test part for testing it. And it works exactly the same way as with a support vector machine, only that we need to tell uh, the grid search where it needs to adjust the parameter C and gamma. So here uh, the make pipeline gives names to all the steps and the names are just the lowercase um, name of the class. So the a support vector classifier is called SVC and then there's a double underscore which is sort of the syntax here and um, then there's a parameter C and gamma. So apart from this SVC prefix everything looks the same but now you um, make sure that you only use your training part in estimating the mean. So for scaling your data that might not be as important but if you do feature selection that is very important. So and if you do feature selection uh, let's say you want to do a uh, ANOVA test univariate feature selection and you want to select um, the k-best features and you want to find out which from one, th two, three or four are the best features to select. Yeah, I guess this is again uh, Iris. Um, so what you can do now is you can search over th this parameter jointly with the parameters of the classifier. So you can use the final score of the classifier to say what is the best parameter setting for my feature selection. So this will now search over all these possible combinations of the parameters. Okay, um, so I mean, this already lets you build sort of slightly complex pipelines, um, but they're all very linear. You, we can go even a bit more crazy and do uh, what we call feature unions. 
Here, the idea is that you want to extract different kinds of features on the same data set. Let's say you have some pandas data frame and you want to extract different features from different columns. Or you have some text data and you want to extract um, features on the words, features on the characters, and also how many uppercase letters are there. And you want to feed, uh, feed the data in your pipeline, extract all these features, then concatenate the features and feed them to your classifier. And that is what feature union allows you to do. Um, there's also in the pipeline module, there's this function called make union, and you just give it a set of transformers. Then these will be fit in parallel on the same data, and the result will just be concatenated. So here I use the example of uh, for some text data, the count vectorizer. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but this is just feature extraction for text, once on the character level, once on the word level. And um, make union means I concatenate them together. And um, now I can call make pipeline out of these um, two feature extraction methods and a classifier. And so this uh, text pipe is now a slightly complex object which extracts two kinds of features and then there's a classification on it. And again, I can, for example, grid search the parameter C here. Um, as I did before, I have to tell it, well, this is a linear SVC, it's the name of this uh, step here in the pipeline, and I can adjust this. Um, what I can also do is I can adjust the um, parameters of these, step, of these feature extraction things. So um, let's say I want to um, look at how many characters do I look at in my feature extractions or how do I, many words do I want to look at, which is the ngram range parameter. And so if I want to adjust this, I have to again use this underscore notation, only there's now two levels of indirection. So um, in the pipeline, there's the first step, which is the feature union. And in this feature union, there's the first count vectorizer, which is count vectorizer one, which is this one. And I want to adjust some parameter there. And in the feature union, there's also the second count vectorizer. And I want to adjust some, uh, some parameter there. And then there's the linear SVC in which I want to adjust the C. And uh, so I can tune all these parameters jointly here for all the feature extraction. Um, so one issue with this, though, is if you add, add more and more processing steps, um, the complexity of searching over these parameters will grow exponentially, basically. And um, so you might not want to do this. One way to kind of deal with this, uh, at least partially, is randomized parameter search, which I want to talk about next. So in randomized parameter search, instead of doing grid search, where you specify like a grid of parameters, let's think about the gamma and C for the support vector machine on the left. Instead of doing this, you just draw random samples uh, for, for the parameters. So the idea here is um, that one parameter is important. Let's say this one, this parameter is, is not important, but this one is important. And in green here, you see the function as a function of the important parameter, and in yellow as the the function of the unimportant parameter. And if you sample on this regular grid and you sampled nine points, you did cross-validation nine times for nine different parameter settings. But you only really explored three settings of the important parameter. Whereas if you um, do a randomized layout and you randomly sample your parameters, you tried nine different values of your important parameter. So this will give you a much, much better resolution on the parameters that are actually important. So for this to work, this only kind of makes sense or mostly makes sense if there, some parameters are important and others are not important. Um, but that's often the case, but you don't know adva in advance which are the important parameters. So the thing that's great about this is, I think it's um, step size free for continuous uh, parameters. So you don't need to say, I want to, um, to search my C parameter over these five different points. I just uh, give it a range that I want to search over. Usually I give it a distribution I want to search over. It also it couples the runtime from the search space size. I, I can just say, I want to sample 100 points and I can sample 100 more if I want. And I don't have to tie this to how many parameters I actually want to adjust. And as I said, it's robust against irrelevant parameters. In grid search, if you add an irrelevant parameter, you're gonna, your runtime will increase by a factor of the parameters you try for the irrelevant parameter. For the randomized layout, it doesn't increase at all. So you can add as many irrelevant parameters as you like, which is great. 
OK, so the way to do this in scikit-learn is basically exactly the same as grid search. So I use the same pipeline I used before, where I adjust some parameters of my feature extraction and of the uh, support vector machine. But in, um, so the first two parameters are um, kind of discrete. So, um, but the second, but the last one, the C for the SVM, this is a continuous parameter. So instead of doing this list of these values from point. 001 to 100, this uh, list of six values, what I do is I give it a distribution. So this is expon from uh, SciPy stats. And this looks something like this. So this kind of mirrors this uh, exponential uh, grid that I gave it before. And what I can do then is do randomized search CV, give it the pipeline, give it the param distributions. And um, so that's exactly the same basically as with the grid search, only I have to also give it the number of iterations. And so if you have a lot of continuous variables, you should always use distributions for those. And only then this gives, does this give you a real benefit. I wouldn't use this for very low dimensional spaces where the grid search is very effective. And so in the future, we're going to work on doing Bayesian optimization like um, Spearmint or Hyperopt, if you heard of that. But actually, the randomized search is a very strong baseline for that. So it's very hard to beat. All right. Another way to deal uh, with having a lot of parameters to adjust is uh, generalized cross-validation path algorithms. And um, so I want to motivate this with an example of doing recursive feature el elimination. In recursive feature elimination, you take a classifier, let's say logistic regression, you train it on your, um, on your data set, and then you drop the feature that is least important, let's say the one that has the smallest absolute coefficient. Then you train it again, and you again drop the least important per, uh, feature. And so you can reduce your feature set. So now let's say you want to adjust how many features you want to keep. And you could do this as I could learn using a grid search. So what you're going to do here is, let's say, OK, for a parameter uh, setting, that means we keep all features. We're going to train logistic regression, evaluate it. For the one where we drop one feature, we're going to train logistic regression, drop the least important feature, evaluate it. For the one where we drop two features, we're going to train logistic regression, drop one feature, drop a second feature, and evaluate it. So we're going to do the same work over and over again, um, because grid search three doesn't know that these kind of they depend on each other in an obvious way. So the way to do this is there's a specialized object in scikit-learn called RFECV, so recursive feature elimination cross validation, which will um, drop all features like one by one and then give you the best possible value using cross validation. So this will exploit the structure of uh, this feature elimination to do smarter parameter selection. And so it's, I think it's kind of obvious that how this benefits in this case, but there's also less obvious variants of this. Um, OK, so fit here will just give you the best parameter setting. For example, um, for linear models, there are things called path algorithms, um, particular for Latho. This is pretty um, famous. Here you have on this plot the regularization parameter. And each of these curves shows you a coefficient of a linear model, how it evolves if you uh, vary the regularization parameter. So, um, and you, the thing is you can compute all of the mm, very efficiently at once. So you start off with a very um, strong regularization, everything will be zero, then you decrease the regularization and you can compute what the coefficients will be like and therefore also what your cross-validation score will be like uh, for all values of the regularization path. And you can actually do this for not only for Lasso, but for a lot of linear models. It's implemented in Cycled Learn. Um, so in the newest version 0.16, we have this for logistic regression CV, um, but it's been there longer for uh, Ridge, Ridge Classifier, Lars, ElasticNet, and so on. And so this will, um, in a similar way as this recursive feature elimination did, this will um, do cross validation in a very efficient way to adjust the uh, regularization parameter. So we also have this for feature selection. And it would also be possible, actually, to do this for tree-based models, um, growing trees iteratively for, to different depth. But unfortunately, we haven't implemented that yet. Uh, but it's possible and hopefully also coming in the future. Slight caveat here is that if you use these together with um, grid search, so let's say you build a pipeline where you have some um, feature extraction or something, and then you have logistic regression CV, and then you want to do grid search over that. The grid search will do cross-validation, and then the CV object will do cross-validation again. And so we'll, you will have nested cross-validation, which you probably want to avoid. But we're going to fix that soon. OK. So that's everything I wanted to talk, uh, talk about um, w uh, with 
how to select parameters. Now, things, all of these um, give you a number on which you evaluate which parameters are the best. And these numbers are uh, given giving scoring functions. So for the grid search, randomized search, cross fault score, and the CV objects. And what they do is by default they use accuracy for classification or R squared for regression. But this is not always optimal. In particular, I want to discuss this in the case where you have imbalanced data. So think about the case where you have uh, 9 to 1 imbalanced data. So I think here I did a toy example of classifying the dig digit 7 against all the other digits. So um, one class is 9 times larger than the other class. And so I uh, evaluate my support vector machine on this data set. And I get an uh, accuracy of 90%. Is this a good classifier? No? Depends. Depends? Yeah. So I would claim that there's no way to know that. So if you do a dummy classifier that does the most frequent class, the, this is not a 7 class. It will also get 90% accuracy. So you could say, well, that, that's pretty bad classifier. It has the same accuracy uh, as the dummy classifier. But then you can look at other metrics. For example, a metric that I really like is um, area under the rock curve. And this metric tells you this is a metric between, um, well, basically between 0.5 and 1. And it says this is basically a perfect classifier. It's close to 1. And uh, this is the reason why I like this score much more than accuracy for imbalanced data uh, sets. So what the score does, it, it computes the area under the rock curve. The rock curve is the false positive rate against the true positive rate. And what it, it does is it doesn't take the classification outcome of the classifier, but it takes its uh, certainty score, so the, the distance to the hyperplane at the support vector machine, for example. And then um, it varies where to put a threshold to decide if it's a positive class or a negative class. You can see this as a ranking loss that um, it measures how often did you give something a, a higher score that was supposed to be negative, or how often did you put a negative example above a positive. And um, so if you use this score, then your classifier was basically perfect. But I also tried two different classifiers here, which are just a support vector machine with different values of gamma. And they all have the same uh, accuracy, but they have different levels of AOC. So one is the blue one, this is the default parameters, basically that's perfect. The green one is pretty bad, and the red one is just randomly. And they all have the same accuracy, so this is really a bad, sco uh, bad score here. One thing to keep in mind when using um, scoring functions like uh, ROC AOC is that the, uh, that really is invariant to the threshold. So we didn't do perfectly. It's, it says we did perfectly, basically, but we only have accuracy of 90%. That means we did a bad job of picking the threshold on, to say where is the positive class and where is the negative class. So that's something you need to keep in mind. So there's a lot of metrics available in scikit-learn, and you can just pick it, as you saw here, by providing a string to the scoring argument. So all the classes I talked about, all the functions, they all have the scoring argument, and you can just give it a string. And there's this uh, scorer's dictionary in the metric module, and it tells you all the scores that you can use. This is also on the website. Um, I think by now it, even it grew a little bit. And the easiest way to use different scoring functions is just specify a string, because it knows whether to use the predict function or whether to use the decision function or the log loss, for example, needs the classifier to predict the probability distribution. You can also define your own metric um, by defining just any callable that has as a signature um, an estimate that it was trained together with data and labels, um, for, at least for a supervised case. And so you th should think about this as being the, th the estimated that was already trained and the test data and the test labels. And then you can do anything and return any score. Higher should be better. And uh, use this in your grid search or your cross-validation. And here, for example, um, I just used uh, accuracy, but I penalized um, estimators that are very non-sparse. But you can come up with anything you like. OK. So that was really all I wanted to say about model selection. And um, sort of the second thing I wanted to talk about is out-of-core learning. So what is out-of-core learning? That means learning when your data doesn't fit into RAM. I'll use it sort of uh, a synonymous with online learning, which is not really, well, but 
let's just say uh, it's when your data doesn't fit into RAM. Scikit-learn is mostly built about your data being in RAM as a NumPy array, but there's also some things you can do when you, uh, it's not the case. Mostly I want to say, don't do it. It's so much cheaper to just get a bigger machine. <laughs> and really, so this is the easy to machine. Just get a machine on the cloud. It's so much cheaper than a data scientist. So actually, I usually do this on my old laptop, which has four gigabyte of RAM, which is a million data points with, with a thousand dense features, which is, I would argue, already slightly big. You can also get like, yeah, an Amazon cloud machine. Amazon doesn't pay me anymore, by the way, but you just get one of these machines and it has uh, 86 million data points with a thousand features dense. That's, I would argue, that's slightly large. So who really has more data than that? Okay, hands up, who has more than 256 gigabyte of data usually? One, two, three, four, maybe five people, six people. Okay, so I don't deny this exists, but really for the majority of people, you should just get one of these, or maybe you can even do your stuff on the laptop. Even at Amazon, I could often do things on just these machines. Anyhow, so, so for the five people in the room that actually have this kind of data, um, th the rest is for you. So there's a couple of algorithms that uh, support this, and in particular, there's this uh, stochastic gradient descent classifier and some derivatives like the perceptron and uh, SGD regressor and passive aggressive regressor and classifier, all the naive base algorithms, mini batch k means for clustering, incremental PCA for dimensionality reduction, mini batch dictionary learning um, for dictionary learning. Um, and so the way that this works is with the partial fit interface. So usually if you get your estimator and you call fit on it, and it'll forget anything it saw before. So if you can call fit on iris, then call fit on MNIST, then call fit on uh, ImageNet, and it'll not remember any of the previous data sets. But um, with the partial fit interface, it will remember what it saw before and try to improve. So here, this is just sort of doing stochastic gradient, and, and you give it more data to do more gradient descent. Um, so what you have to do yourself with scikit-learn is basically you have to uh, load the data from disk. This is what I do here. I do like, I imagine I have like nine batches, and I load um, these batches from disk, and then give them one by one to this partial fit. And for the classifiers, I also have to tell it what are the classes that actually may, may occur in this data set. Um, and so for the SGD classifier, you might want to go over the data multiple times because it will only do like a single update on each batch. So you might want to iterate over your batches. Uh, the same goes for the k-means and mini-batch dictionary learning. For the um, naive base classifiers, it's actually a closed form solution. So it's enough if you iterate over your data once. Okay, so, but this is basically all there is. You need to take care of creating the batches yourself, and then you can call partial fit. You should make the batches as big as possible to fit into RAM because um, each time you call partial fit, there's some overhead to, it'll check that your data is okay and everything. So you should make the big batches as big that they uh, just fit into RAM. Okay, so the thing about this um, out of core online learning is it's really hard to build pipelines because you don't see all your data. And um, so what I advocate is to make things easy is to use uh, what I call stateless transformers, which are transformers that don't actually learn from the data. They're in cycle learning, but they're not machine learning really. Um, so you can use them without ever seeing the rest of your data. Simplest one is normalizer, which just normalizes each data point to um, unit length, which is kind of boring. Next one is hashing vectorizer, which I'll talk about in a second, and RBF sampler, which is kernel approximation. And yeah, so I want to talk about these a little bit more. Um, so the hashing vectorizer is for doing out of core text learning or text learning with very large data sets. And maybe for those who are not super familiar with uh, working on text data, small reminder, standard way to represent um, text and machine learning is bag of word representation. That's kind of the simplest way to do it. It's implemented in count vectorizer or TF-IDF vectorizer. And you start off with a data set of strings, like here. And so what you do is you first tokenize your data set using some uh, regular expression and normalize it. So in cycle learn, there's something very simple, just uh, splits basically by white space and lower cases it. Then you have all these tokens for your one data point, but you can also collect all the, to uh, the tokens in your whole training set. And you build a vocabulary, all out of all your tokens. So let's say all the tokens were from Advac to Zisk. And then um, you imagine a large sparse matrix where you put in the counts for each of your data points, how often does each token appear? So um, 
most of them will be zero because here our current string here only has five words, so there will be only five ones in there, and all the rest will be zeros. And then we use a sparse matrix encoding because we don't want to store all these zeros. That's the standard back of word representation, but the problem here is that you need to um, store the whole vocabulary. So at least you need to go over the data set once to start with this, and then you need to store the whole vocabulary. So what the hashing trick does is it gets rid of storing the vocabulary and um, it's implemented in the hashing vectorizer. So it starts the same way with tokenizing the, uh, the data, but then instead of using um, a lookup table, you just hash each of your tokens. So this hash function is something that takes in a string and gives out an integer number. So I give it each of these tokens, and I limit the integer number to be, let's say, smaller than 2 to the 10 or 2 to the 20 or something like that. Um, and then this will, so, and this integer number will serve as an index into your sparse matrix. So I'll just say in my huge sparse matrix that, um, that is mostly zeros at point, uh, what, 832,412, I put a one in that's for the U because my hash of U is this number. So um, this way I never have to see the whole data set and I can uh, create a sparse matrix encoding um, one string by uh, string by string. And so, yeah, that's how this looks in practice. So here I created an SGD classifier and a hashing vectorizer. Now I load batches of strings and uh, put them in the hashing vectorizer. I just call transform. I get out um, the sparse matrix representation and then uh, fit the SGD on that. So one downside of using the hashing is that you can't really go back. So if you learn the linear model like this, you can't go back and say, what does this coefficient mean? Because the hashing might um, have uh, collisions, so multiple words might go to the same, um, same number. It's usually not a problem. Uh, I think there's papers about that it's not a problem. So, uh, but it means that you can't interpret your um, coefficients as easily. But with this, you can basically learn on arbitrary large text data sets, which is nice. So the next stateless transform I want to talk about are um, kernel approximations, which is, I think, my first contribution to scikit learn and actually maybe the only algorithm that I contributed, I'm not sure. Um, so just a very quick reminder, the kernel trick. Okay, who, who here knows what a kernel trick is? Ah, OK. Very quick one. So you have your data. You want to classify the blue points versus the red, uh, the green points versus the red points, but you want to use a linear classifier and it doesn't work. So what you do is you can apply a feature function to your data and, uh, for example, square your features, and then all of a sudden, a linear classifier works in this expanded feature space. Then you realize that for training um, a linear classifier, you only need to know the inner products between your features, not the features themselves. and you think, hey, now I can make up all kinds of different functions that I call k, which is the kernel function, and uh, don't have to think about what kind of features do they correspond to. And if I use a linear kernel, I'll just get the original data. If I use a polynomial kernel, I can do arbitrary long polynomial expansions without actually computing them. If I use a RBF kernel, I get possibly infinite dimensional um, features. That's great. And you can, but the problem here is that if you want to uh, solve a kernelized SVM, it's sort of uh, n to the uh, number of samples uh, cubed. Writing down the whole matrix, which you usually can avoid, is n, to the square, is n squared, but sort of solving it is usually around n cubed. Uh, whereas solving a linear SVM, for example, or just a linear classifier is more or less linear in the samples, at least Leon Boutou says so. Um, so the problem, so if you have number of samples so large that you can't fit your stuff into RAM, and then you don't want something that is cu uh, quadratic or cubic in the runtime. So what you, we uh, do now is we just forget about everything that I just talked about, and we go back to feature maps. Um, so, so this is what machine learning people did in the last 10 years, I don't know. They first they went to kernels and they went back. And um, so the idea of the kernel approximation is that you construct a explicit feature map so that the inner product between these features is about the same as your kernel. And um, for example, for the exponential kernel, um, this is implemented in the RBF sampler. This is um, also called random kitchen sinks. 
So basically, it constructs a feature map. You can choose how big it should be, but the scalar product of these features will be approximately the RBF kernel. So this allows you to do um, learn kernel SVMs with data that doesn't fit into RAM by using this explicit feature map. So you can use this RBF sampler. You have to give it the gamma for your um, RBF kernel. You have to tell it how many features it should construct. And then you can, so you have to actually fit it once to, so that it knows what the dimensionality of the data is. But then you can go through each batch, call transform, get your uh, transformed features, and um, train the SGD classifier on it. So this will basically learn approximately a kernel SVM um, on data that doesn't fit into RAM. Okay, so now after I told you how to do this with uh, scikit-learn, the hashing trick and learning kernel approximations, actually if you're really serious about this, you might want to check out Vopal Webit because we are here at Microsoft. So John Langford has an awesome machine learning package for doing online learning and out-of-core learning. So we can do this with scikit-learn, but I think they can do it a little bit better maybe, or at least pretty fast too. So if you want to do out-of-core learning, you should also check out that. Um, anyhow, so in the last part of my talk, I want to talk about highlights from 016. So 016 was, uh, we just released it on Friday or Saturday morning, something like that. And just very briefly, so what we did, what we added uh, here is multinomial logistic regression, which is maybe surprising that we added this just now. Before we had logistic regression just from liblinia, which is super fast, but is one versus rest. Um, and so it's a bit weird. Um, we added re logistic regression CV, which is this um, fast cross-validation to give you the best um, regularization parameter, incremental PCA to do out-of-core PCA, probability calibration for classifiers, which I want to talk about in a second, bridge clustering, which is um, also, you can do out-of-core clustering with that. It comes more from the data mining community, LSH forests for doing approximate nearest neighbors. Um, it's supposed to be self-tuning um, locally semantic hashing. And um, so, and we also have more uh, robust integration with pandas now, because we can now give pandas data frames to any estimator and will not crash and burn, which is good. Also, pandas tends to give you NumPy arrays of D-type object uh, with numbers in them, but it doesn't tell you that they are numbers. And so now we're more robust to that. Okay, but the last thing I want to talk about is probability cal calibration, which is what we uh, just added. Basically, what it does is there's this calibrated classifier CV, which um, can turn either a classifier, which doesn't have probability estimates, such as a support vector machine, into one that does have them. Or it takes one that has bad probability estimates, like a random forest classifier, and takes it into, makes it into one that has good probability estimates. And um, by good, I mean calibrated. So what does calibration mean? It means that if I have an estimate classifier and tells me I'm 90% sure this is class one, it should be correct 90% of the time. Otherwise, these 90% are meaningless. And so what this does is it uses um, cross-validation to train a classifier on a part of the data set and then calibrate the probability so that they actually reflect how well the uh, classifier predicts. And this plot here, this is what's called a calibration broad plot. Um, so for a given percentage that you pick, how many positive examples were actually predicted. So if you give make a, a threshold at 50%, when a classifier says 50%, uh, it's 50% um, certain, it should predict 50% positives. And so if you do logistic regression, it usually does very a good job, which is the uh, blue one here. If you do a support vector machine and try to run it through a sigmoid, it's a bad idea and you get a green curve. But if you use the um, calibrated classifier CV, then it works pretty well. So why should you care about probability estimates? One reason is if you actually make decisions that are, say, like money worth, if, and you know how much do you have to pay if you do um, false positive or false negative, you can use these probabilities and like decision theory to tell you what to do. Or maybe you're just doing a Kaggle competition with a log loss, then this will also help you because log loss needs pro uh, probability distributions. Okay, that's all I want to say. Apart from our documentation is awesome. Look at our documentation. It has everything I said and much, much more. Also, Center for Data Science is hiring, and particularly hiring people like me. So it's a shameless plug. Uh, if you want to do open source for data science, machine learning, visualization, um, any data, data crunching, we just hire people to do 
open source full time. So if you like open source and you want to help scientists, talk to me. And this is, oh, there's also, there's, if you're interested in what's new, there's a webcast with me and Olivier Crisel with O'Reilly on Thursday morning, if you're interested. But yeah, that's it. Thanks. Oh, questions? No, we're not going to do it. Right. <laughs> so we do. Can you go into that a little bit more, though? Yes. I'm sure, like you get that question all the time. Yes. So that's why it's in the FAQ. But, uh, so basically, our standpoint is, it's too hard to build it reliable, reliably. Um, we have people that say like, uh, "Oh, this broke on Solaris with this and this version of GCC," and then we have to go in and fix it. So on Strata, actually, I said something like this, and then Travis Oliphant says, oh, that's so easy, just Conda install. Uh, but that means that scikit-learn would rely on Conda, and we don't want that. So you can install scikit-learn basically on any machine. Now it's, it's pretty cross-platform, and we want to keep it that way, and we want to focus more on um, yeah, being cross-platform than on GPU support. Oh. So if we want to do some like, deep learning stuff, you just recommend using other tools for now. Yeah, so we're going to include some deep learning stuff for like if you want to get your feet wet, but if you want to be serious about it, use other tools. Also, you often want to specify like your actual architecture, and scikit-learn has more of a black box approach. It gives you an algorithm, it doesn't give you a way to build an algorithm. So if you want to build, and in deep learning, you often want to build your own model. And there's good libraries out there maintained by very smart people that can do a much better job. Yes, we kicked out a hidden Markov model for two reasons. One is the API is kind of not compatible because it dealt with sequence learning. And basically, everything in scikit-learn is matrix in, matrix out. So it's always number of samples times number of features. And um, having one thing in there that's have a sort of a different API makes it very awkward because it doesn't work together with the cross-validation, the grid search, and everything else. The other reason is that none of the core developers was working on it. And this means it had pretty low quality compared to the rest. So that, um, you need really one person that is sort of responsible and that will uh, ma keep maintaining it so that it has a high quality standard. So if there's no one on the project who actually knows the code, who's actually using the code, you cannot really maintain it in a, to a good state. And so we, we didn't really f feel comfortable with the code because no one really knew it anymore. Those are the two reasons. Um, what kind of libraries would you suggest? What kind of libraries would you suggest for HMMs and neural nets? Definitely not the same library. Um, so for I mean, if you want for HMMs, it depends. If you want to do unsupervised stuff, that's HMM Learn, which is just a cycle learn HMM that gets kicked out. There's um, if you want to do actually CRFs like supervised stuff, there's stuff called I mean. Do you want to do it for sequences, is the question. I and mean, there's a seek learn by Lars, which is fast. There's, uh, for general structure prediction, there's my PyStruct. Also depends if you want to do Python or not. Um, for deep learning. Um, Let's say Python. Yeah, OK. I mean, yeah. So I th probably seek learn, seq learn. That just, I mean, that's CRFs. For unsupervised HMMs, I don't know another one than HMM learn. Um, and for deep learning, uh, depends on your level of abstraction, definitely Theano. And if that's too low level for you, then you can do PyLearn2 maybe. Um, there's also SKLearn Theano, which is pretty new, but they wrap some existing models. And I think they're going to be interesting too. And obviously, there's like Cafe and stuff. It's not Python. Anything else? No. Well, the question is, how does this integrate with MapReduce? And I mean, depends. So this is like, it computes a model on a single machine using arbitrary many cores often, but on a single machine. So you can parallelize it arbitrarily 
for grid searches, for example. You can grid search a, a different set of parameters on any box. You don't actually need MapReduce for that. You can do something much more simple because you just need to send like the parameter setting and then the thing will compute. You cannot actually do any parallelization over um, of the algorithm. Then again, if you um, if your data is smaller than 256 gigabyte of RAM, then you'll be faster doing it on a single core than trying to do MapReduce. Often. Let's say often. <laughs> Once you create an uh, algorithm that you want to actually use in production, is there an easy or standard way to get all of the required parameters out? So for example, like if you train up a random forest to get all of the decision trees and everything out, to, it has to be implemented in like C sharp or something, whatever you put <laughs> Well, if, if it has to be implemented in C-sharp, maybe talk to the Microsoft people. They, they also have some random forests. Uh, Sebastian Novotzin wrote them. They're pretty good. Um, but I mean, if it's a linear model or it's an SVM, it's very easy to get it out. If it's decision trees, you have to write a lot of custom code to implement them. I mean, you can, we thought about doing export to uh, PMML or something, but it's kind of, there's people who wrote exporters to uh, JSON for the random forests. But yeah, I mean, in the end, you have to implement your own stuff in C sharp, and it's going to be so much more work than the export, than the export part. What's the um, compute cost for the calibrated classifier? Uh, well, it's the K in your cross-validation times the number of the underlying classifier. So if you do tenfold cross-validation, you're going to lose one-tenth of your data on average, and uh, it's going to be 10 times as long. Okay. Also, I mean, because you're not using all of your data, you, it's not guaranteed to be better in the end in terms of log loss. You mean like at the same time, changing the hyperparameters while you're learning? <laughs> I mean, it depends. Um, so for linear models, you can definitely, you could use warm starting, like change your um, regularization parameter. And things like changing the learning rate is like something that people often do. But um, I don't know what kind of parameters you want to adjust. In a random forest, you're going to have problems. Uh, Usually, um, but you can definitely, I mean, it's if you have a solution for one hyperparameter in a linear model and you'd say, or like for one regularization parameter and you want to learn for another one, it would be stupid to just throw away the one that you already learned. I'm not sure if I understand your setting. Yeah. So can I use a kind of meta learning on top of that, like hyperparameter optimization to do that, or not? Not out of the box with scikit-learn. In general, yes, definitely. I mean, you could think about doing uh, yeah, more online learning kind of things, where you kind of, I mean, I'm not sure, do you want to minimize your regret over time? Then there's like a bunch of papers you can look up. But yeah, maybe you can talk about it offline. You can also ask me. I can hang out with you. So I was, I, I was asked to give the hardest possible talk. <laughs> and I said that at the beginning. There's also a version of this that is like where there's like 90 slides, that, but the content stopped after the fifth slide here. So um, but Vivian actually gave a, a more introductory talk like two months ago or three months. I don't know. I recorded it. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, but I, I can hang out at a coffee machine too, with, if you want. <laughs> Thank you so much.
so much. I have.